Hello, and welcome to Distillations, a podcast powered by the Science History Institute. I'm Alexis Petrick. And I'm Lisa Berry Drago. Each episode of Distillations takes a deep dive into a moment of science-related history in order to shed some light on the present. Today, we begin in the Middle Ages, where the story of one extraordinary woman might help us understand a present-day health problem. When you're making your list of badass feminists throughout history, don't forget to include the 12th century German nun, St. Hildegard von Bingen, because she was badass. She was a poet, a scholar, a writer, a composer, a healer, an herbalist, a scientist, a mystic, and yeah, in a sense, a proto-feminist. During her lifetime, she challenged the patriarchy, founded two monasteries, wrote books about theology and ecology, natural science, medicine, and even gardening. Oh, and also she composed hundreds of hymns and songs. People continue to revere her centuries later. She actually has a seat at the feminist table in Judy Chicago's Dinner Party, the seminal work of art from the 1970s. You can go visit her place setting at the Brooklyn Museum, alongside Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Virginia Woolf, and Sacagawea. There are multiple movies and books about her. And in 2013, the indie psychedelic folk musician Devendra Banhart even wrote a song about her. Hildegard von Bingen did a lot of impressive things, but one thing about her stood out. She's more well known for her visions, which at the time were thought to have a more heavenly origin. I labor with great sweat with this vision. I am full of fear. Oh, good and gentle God, teach me what I ought to say. Hildegard documented her visions in an illustrated manuscript called Scivius. It was just one of the books she wrote. It would be impressive for anyone to do all the things that Hildegard von Bingen did. But she did them all while suffering from chronic illness and pain on and off for most of her life. The mysticism that drew so many people to her, it was connected to her illness. When you look at her visions, it becomes clear that she had aura, aura of migraine. 900 years after Hildegard von Bingen experienced vision slash migraines, the condition still mystifies us today. Anne Hoffman is a reporter, a professor, and a chronic migraine sufferer. And over the past year, she's been tracing the history of migraines to try and understand them, to see if she can find any clues about a treatment that'll actually work for her. Anne's journey took her in some interesting directions. And one common theme that she found a whole lot of stigma. Chapter 1. The Migraines Begin. Anne Hoffman takes it from here. A few months ago, my boyfriend Andy and I were sitting in a rented car, driving down the freeway in Central California. The evening was warm, the scenery idyllic. We had just passed through San Luis Obispo. It was shrouded in mist. Gorgeous. But I couldn't stop worrying. The one thought I couldn't get out of my head? What if I lose my vision right now while I'm driving on this unfamiliar highway? Some version of this had been playing constantly in my mind for the past few months. The worry attacked me while I was teaching, while I was on deadline, even as we sat with friends over for dinner. I get chronic migraines. Migraines affect up to one in seven people, mostly women. In fact, about three times more women than men. They have a huge impact on society. They make people call out sick from work, and they negatively affect the economy. But for all the pain they cause, they're still shrouded in mystery. But here are a few things that we do know about them. Migraines aren't just bad headaches, they're a neurological disorder. Most migraines involve throbbing on one side of the head. During an attack, sufferers are typically sensitive to light and loud noises. We know that people with migraines get nauseous, they might vomit. Migraine sufferers are twice as likely to experience epilepsy and vice versa. And on top of all these dramatic symptoms, migraine sufferers don't get the same social understanding and acceptance as people with things like epilepsy or diabetes. And worse, they're usually met with stigma. Perhaps most dramatic of all, the more migraines you get, the more likely you are to get more migraines. (laughs) It's a vicious cycle. Migraines can put me out for days, but the thing I hate the most is the vision loss. It's called an aura. 
Most migraine sufferers don't get them. I'm in the minority. They come before the pain phase, and it starts with me seeing a zigzag pattern. And over time, I can't really see anything at all. Sometimes it's just a big, fuzzy blur. If I keep my eyes open, I get so nauseous that I want to throw up. This used to happen once a year, but sometime around Christmas of 2017, I started getting these auras at least twice a month. There's no one cure or treatment plan for migraines, so by February, I tried a lot of things, and the migraines were only increasing in frequency. Chapter 2. The Medical History of Migraines Also, Sexism Ancient Egyptian scriptures from 1200 BCE describe painful migraine-like headaches. The ancient Greek doctor Hippocrates, you know, the guy who's called the father of modern medicine and the one who actually wrote the Hippocratic Oath, he talked about headaches with visual disturbances, a.k.a. auras, around 400 BCE. But it wasn't until the 2nd century AD that migraines were officially discovered by the Greek doctor Arateus of Cappadocia. Now, he described them as affecting one side of the head, a description that still rings true. And this led to the term migraine, which comes from the Greek word hemicrania, or half skull. After a few thousand years, you'd think we might know more about migraines than we do. Anne McGregor is a doctor who specializes in women's health and headaches in London, and she gets migraines herself. The very first migraine attack I had, I was, at, I was a medical student at the time, and I was actually in hospital at the time. I'd been unwell, and I could suddenly see this very bright light zigzagging across my field of vision. It had started just as this, this white, bright, bright spot. And I thought I'd had a stroke. I really did not know what was wrong with me. And I spoke to the um, the medical team about it, the doctors, and they said, well, they didn't really know what it was <laughs> as well. Anne thinks suggestions for how to treat migraines can be unhelpful at best and harmful at worst. If you actually listened to everything or you read everything about managing headaches, you'd never be able to live at all because people will be telling you that you can't eat cheese, you can't eat chocolate, you can't drink any alcohol, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's all really, really negative. In popular imagination, migraines have become a woman's illness, even though we know that migraines affect men too. We know that doctors underestimate female pain, and that could explain why we just know less about migraines. They aren't studied as much as other chronic illnesses. Throughout history, the causes and treatment of migraines have been linked to superstition. In the Middle Ages, Hildegard von Bingen thought her migraine auras were visions, messages from God. She called them reflections of the living light. These mysteries and wonders which I reveal to you were previously unknown. But I show and give them to you now so that you may make them known to the burning hearts of the faithful. Around this time, migraines also became associated with witchcraft. In the 18th century, migraines were tied to race and class. Wealthier people were thought to have more delicate nervous systems. You might be wittier, you might be more creative, more musical, more literary, uh, but it came with uh, this downside that you might get sick more often. You might be more fragile. Joanna Kempner is a sociologist who wrote a book about migraines called Not Tonight, Migraine and the Politics of Gender and Health. And she lives with migraines herself. In contrast, people who were working class would have, uh, were thought to have more ropier, thicker nerves, like actually like phys physiologically ropier nerves. And those nerves made people sturdier and it meant that they didn't feel pain as much, but it also meant that they weren't, they were like slower in thinking. And if, you were a person who was from Africa and perhaps, you know, a slave in the New World. Uh, the belief was that your nerves were so thick and ropey that you couldn't feel pain at all. And of course, that would mean that you wouldn't have very quick thoughts. So uh, this whole notion of, uh, of, of what nervous systems uh, did and how they transmitted pain was the kind of basis for this uh, race, race and class hierarchy and the scientific notions of race. 
And this idea grows in the 19th century. So people with a nervous temperament who have migraine, like the the elite and intellectuals, particularly men, are people who, uh, if you have a nervous temperament, you might be creative, you might be able to think really quickly, but you might get struck by migraine if, if you do it, too much of that work. Like if you're doing too much writing, you might need to take a break because that will bring on a migraine. Today we know that migraines mostly affect women, but one of the most influential migraine researchers focused mostly on men. His name was Harold Wolf and he's considered the father of headache medicine. In the 1930s and 40s, he developed a concept known as the migraine personality, and that's an idea that's still around today. The reason why he is revered in headache medicine now is because he was very scientific about understanding migraine. He did a lot of experiments demonstrating that migraine was uh, actually biological and uh, linked to changes in cranial vasculature. Wolf suffered from migraines himself, and it seems like he projected his own personality onto the disease. He worked at Cornell Medical School on New York's Upper East Side, so he saw mostly wealthy people, people who were highly successful and hardworking, people like him. And so he started to think about people with migraine as ambitious, successful, perfectionist, and efficient. He thought they were good people of good moral character. And he thought they were linked to the cranial vasculature because these people get stressed out and their cranial vasculature would kind of get uh, tight. And then when they finally were able to relax, their cranial vasculature would get too big, it would expand, and that would be the migraine. And so he would suggest to them that they should go play some squash every afternoon. He was mostly talking about his male patients, which I found interesting. I thought that he was going to be talking completely about women. But uh, in medicine, people, I found physicians mostly talked about their men, male patients. And I think that this was fairly typical. But here's where things get even weirder. He theorized that women with migraines were inadequate wives and mothers. He saw them as chronically unsatisfied housewives incapable of completing socially conscripted wifely duties. That's right, I'm talking about sex. He talked about them as frigid. When he talked about his male patients with migraine and their sex lives, he also thought that they were sexually unsatisfied, but of course he thought that was because they had wives who wouldn't have sex with them. So one of the things that I see throughout migraine uh, medicine is that Uh, This very gendered and really incredibly sexist way of saying that people with migraine, uh, when they have problems, the men, it's always about, you know, they're using their brain, they're studying too hard, they're writing things that are like too brilliant, and the women, like, they should not be thinking at all, and, you know, there's something wrong with their, the way they have sex. In the 1960s and 1970s, there were panels full of physicians who openly talked about putting their migraine patients in psychiatric facilities. Women with migraines became women with mental illness. So it's not surprising that in our current era, Kempner herself was amazed to be treated with respect by doctors. You know, many years ago, uh, when I was first getting into the field, I had become so accustomed to having my pain dismissed by physicians uh, and so accustomed to be treating to, to having been treated like a neurotic woman, uh, that when I went to my first uh, headache conference, uh, I was shocked to see that there were pictures of brains everywhere. I couldn't believe that all of these headache doctors were taking migraines so seriously. I don't know what I expected. Like maybe I thought that they would all just be laughing at me. Like I was so, I was like, wow, look at all these people taking this pain I have seriously. And it, it felt great. But at the same time, Kempner noticed that doctors talked about how people with migraines were different. They said their brains couldn't handle things like changes in weather or estrogen. I, I was like, oh, I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to be helpful. But I was worried about that. And I didn't think that actually it sounded that much different than the things I was reading in through history. It's always still about the person with migraine trying to protect themselves against these external forces. You got to protect your brain against everything malevolent that's happening around it. And the thing about putting the causes of migraine on the individual is that it also puts the responsibility for solution or relief on the individual. Migraine medication is advertised much like many other pharmaceutical ads. Usually, almost always, it's white women and they're done up in a, such a way that you think maybe they're much richer than you are. Migraines aren't just bad headaches. 
They steal moments from my life. This is an advertisement for Excedrin. There's a white woman lying in bed. She's rubbing her temples and the room is dark. Her cell phone beeps and it shows a photo of her husband and child. It works fast and lasts for hours. Excedrin specializes in treating migraines, which is why moments lost to migraines are moments gained with Excedrin. By showing all of these women not doing the thing they're supposed to do, like taking care of children or, you know, being there for their family or being at work, they're really ignoring the fact that most people with migraine or most people with chronic pain are actually showing up all the time and doing their work and taking care of what they need to care for as best they can. Uh, maybe it's not always pretty and maybe it doesn't always look great and maybe it's not the best, uh, the way they want to do it, but people in pain are warriors. Migraine ads play on this sense of guilt where women are supposed to be devoted wives, mothers, and employees. Migraine robs them of this. Migraine medication is the answer. Even though we know that no medication is perfect, not even remotely. Chapter 3. A Historic Remedy Most migraine drugs don't actually stop migraines. They help prevent them or reduce the severity of the symptoms. And for a long time, they weren't even specifically for migraines. They were drugs designed to treat high blood pressure, epilepsy, or depression. So you can probably guess that they were not a perfect solution. Here's Anne. I take beta blockers. Beta blockers are an old school blood pressure medication that help reduce the number of migraines for some people. And doctors aren't sure why, but they come with some undesirable side effects. Some of the ones I've experienced have been depression, weight gain, a slower heart rate, and an overall sense of moving more slowly. So I started wondering if there wasn't something better out there, something without so many side effects, maybe something unconventional. One idea that I started hearing about a lot seemed really promising. The only problem was that it was illegal, or at least it exists in a legal gray area. That's right, I'm talking about pot, ganja, weed, mota, reefer, cannabis. Through a friend of a friend, I met a woman who works in the cannabis industry in California. Her name is Erica Kelly. Erica suffered from terrible migraines since she was a kid. She told me the story of her first one. She was 10 years old and her family was moving. I couldn't even just do simple things like get little bags out from the car and take them into the house um, at all. I was completely debilitated. I remember feeling so bad because my brothers were moving my stuff around. Kelly's family got her the best possible care. She went to the Mayo Clinic. She was in migraine studies. She was even put on triptans. Until recently, those were the only drugs that were just for migraines. But nothing helped Erica long term, and when she turned 25, her migraines started getting worse. She started getting cyclic vomiting syndrome. Her migraines spread to her abdomen. She'd throw up every 20 minutes until she was so depleted she had to go to the hospital. Then someone gave her a cannabis tincture for anxiety. So I was using it for that, but I didn't even realize, like, just after a while, I noticed that my headaches were gone, (laughs) that I just wasn't getting them. It was like a month went by and then two months, and then six months, and then a year, and then two years. And, you know, up until now, I just, I do not get headaches anymore. Erica's story made cannabis seem like a miracle drug, and she wasn't the only one talking about it this way. I started thinking, maybe I should try it too. When I was talking to Ann McGregor, the headache specialist we heard from earlier, I tentatively asked her about medical cannabis for migraines, And contrary to my expectations, she didn't shut me down. She told me that it could be promising, either to prevent them or stop them after they've started. But then she explained a big caveat. Marijuana is a Schedule I drug in the U.S. It's in the same category as heroin, which makes it really hard to study here. And the U.S. is where most clinical trials happen. Joanna Kempner told me the same thing. The restrictions on clinical trials for medical marijuana are such that research has been essentially squashed. And this has made it very challenging for people who want to use cannabis for migraine treatment. 
in headache medicine, there's a growing uh, consensus that cannabis is a very useful drug for migraine, but we just need more research. And in fact, I think the federal government would be doing everyone a great service if they would both loosen these regulations and fund that research, particularly since it's going to be difficult to get pharmaceutical industries very interested in funding research on drugs that have existed for a long time. Hey guys, Alexis here. I just want to cut in for a moment and say that we could do a whole episode just about medical marijuana. Frankly, we could do a whole series. We could devote an entire podcast in perpetuity to just this subject. But for this episode, here's what you need to know. The cannabis plant is complicated. It contains hundreds of chemicals, and they all do different things. Maybe. We actually don't even know yet. But for this story, we're going to focus on two main chemical compounds, CBD and THC. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, is the main psychoactive compound in cannabis. And while it has therapeutic uses, it's best known as the part of the plant that gets you high. Cannabidiol, or CBD, is the second most prominent compound found in the cannabis plant. And it's all the rage right now. You've probably seen it on store shelves in the forms of oils and tinctures or CBD gummy bears, even in places where it's not quite legal. People are excited because it seems like it may be an anti-inflammatory. And it's now being touted as a way to treat chronic pain, anxiety, and a whole lot of other things. Back to Anne. Harvard Medical School says that the strongest scientific evidence for CBD's effectiveness lies with treating what they say are some of the cruelest childhood epilepsy syndromes, which typically don't respond to anti-seizure meds. Joanna Kempner says epilepsy and migraines are close neurological cousins, so I wondered if the fact that CBD can help with seizures means it might be able to help with migraines. I was hopeful. And there have been a few small studies looking into cannabis for migraines. An Italian study found that after giving a small group of migraine patients CBD oil with a little THC, they reported slightly fewer migraines than the group who took an antidepressant. Another small study in Colorado found that among 121 patients, the frequency of migraine headaches decreased with regular cannabis use. There's a lot of talk right now about CBD and its medicinal potential. And since I was pinning my hopes on it for my migraines, I wanted to understand how it worked scientifically. And I was surprised to learn that it's not the only therapeutic part of the cannabis plant. It turns out THC does more than just get you high. THC gets you high and it also reduces pain. (laughs) Margaret Haney is a cannabis researcher. She teaches neurobiology at Columbia University Medical Center. And CBD, yeah. Um, You know, it's not... It's not morphine by any stretch, but it does, you know, it does reduce pain. She says that while CBD has pain relieving potential, what people are buying at dispensaries and in stores might not be strong enough. You know, so what's being sold um, is often at a much, much, much lower dose than what any of us think is going to be medically effective. Plus, many marijuana marketers claim to have CBD-only products, but the reality is often very different. And so some things will say CBD and have THC in them and very little CBD or it's, you know, it, there's people making money and it's an unregulated marketplace. So it's it's not surprising to anybody that things are not going to be what, what you think they are. Scientists know how THC works in the body, but they're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on with CBD. Delta-9 THC binds to two places in our brains and our bodies, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Its effects are quick. That's why if you smoke a joint, you might all of a sudden get very happy. You might laugh. It's a rapid process. But CBD doesn't seem to be working like that. But CBD is still a very complex uh, compound pharmacologically, so it's it's not binding to the same CB1 receptor it seems to be binding to a bunch of other things. So it's, it's, it's a much more complicated pharmacology. And Haney says it's likely that people need to consume CBD over time to feel its effects. So I actually uh, am excited about CBD for a certain number of indications that I want to, I want to see good research on. But the hype is far, far, far in excess of the reality. 
The problem is that even though there is some good research on cannabis and cannabinoids from the last 20 years, the legal limbo marijuana exists in has dampened scientists' ability to do rigorous research. And that's a huge loss, because cannabinoids seem to be good at treating one thing that is notoriously difficult to treat. The National Academy of Sciences really just has published an evaluation of all the science for all the different indications people think of um, that cannabis might be useful for. And the top of the list, and the you know for which there is decent data, is pain. But there's no indication of how much, when, or in what form someone like me should take the drug. So there's still work to be done to figure things out. It's funny that Anne's in the position she's in, because treating migraines with cannabis isn't new. Not by a long shot. Chinese and Indian scholars commented on marijuana's ability to treat neuralgic pain almost 2,000 years ago. And the ancient Greeks wrote about its powers, too. And 900 years ago, our favorite feminist mystic nun, Hildegard von Bingen, wrote about growing cannabis in the garden of the monastery where she lived, in a medical book she called Physica. Hemp is hot. It grows where the air is neither very hot nor very cold, and so is its nature. Its seed is salubrious and good as treat for healthy people. Whoever has an empty brain and head pains may eat it, and the head pains will be reduced. The first person to introduce marijuana to modern Western medicine in a major way was the Irish doctor W.B. O'Shaughnessy. He experimented with cannabis in India, where the drug was commonly used. He experimented on animals and even children, and he also began using marijuana to treat rheumatism and cholera. One property of the drug O'Shaughnessy noticed is that even if marijuana didn't cure a patient, it seemed to lower his anxiety about his illness. It also had strong analgesic or pain-killing effects. In 1890, John Russell Reynolds, then president of the British Medical Association, wrote that migraine sufferers should ingest hemp every day to prevent attacks. Cannabis was a legitimate medical treatment back then, as it was not just in Britain, but in the United States. But we don't have an institutional memory of that now. Brian McGinney is a neurologist and headache specialist in Boston. He also writes about the history of treating migraines with cannabis. What's going on now is talked about as a, a new thing, when really it's a recurrence of something that was in pharmacies many, many decades ago. McGinney says some form of marijuana was available in pharmacies in the U.S., Britain, and France during the 19th and early 20th centuries. In the second half of the 19th century, you could get it in some grocery stores in the U.S. He says there weren't many good treatments for headaches then, and marijuana was value neutral. Remember, at that time, there wasn't a political or a cultural negative vibe about it, like it is today. Chapter 4 the stigmatization of marijuana. Also, racism. One thing that's interesting to think about is like the concept of uh, pharmacopoeia, um, which is essentially, you know, the materials that a group of healers or a society or a culture has identified as those things that have medicinal properties. Matt Crawford is a historian of medicine and an associate professor at Kent State University. He was also a research fellow at the Science History Institute in 2017. And pharmacopias can take official forms, but uh, some historians and scholars have started thinking about, you know, f uh, sort of informal pharmacopias, you know, that, that a, a society or culture may not formally write down or produce, but that exists, right? Cannabis was entered into the United States Pharmacopoeia in 1850 as a treatment for a host of things, including cholera, rabies, alcoholism, opiate addiction, insanity, excessive menstrual bleeding, neuralgia, and virtually any disease that induced convulsions. But soon after that publishing, its time in the sun started to fade. And as we all know, it's no longer in our formal pharmacopoeia. Although that may be slowly changing as more states legalize medical marijuana. Its fall out of favor comes back to stigma, this time the racist kind. And behind it was a man named Harry Anslinger. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against 
the despicable, dope-peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. Anslinger was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now, when he took the job in 1930, prohibition was on its way out. And there's speculation that he was worried he'd be out of a job if he was only going after cocaine and heroin. So he wanted to make all drugs illegal, including cannabis. And he made it a mission um, to try and get federal legislation against uh, marijuana, and he succeeded. Anslinger painted a picture that cannabis would make everyone who smoked it insane. This idea was echoed in the 1936 anti-marijuana propaganda film, Reefer Madness. The film portrayed the drug as dangerous and a gateway drug to heroin. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana. The burning weed with its roots in hell. Anslinger spread an anti-cannabis message that stoked people's worst fears, which brings us to his other argument based on racism. Anslinger preyed on racist fears and associated cannabis with Mexican immigrants and jazz musicians, further stoking people's prejudices. He racialized marijuana. Doing so has had lingering effects. What do most of us call the drug today? Marijuana. What did people call it before Anslinger's campaign? Cannabis. Many believe he used the Spanish word for the drug so that it would be associated specifically with Mexicans. The fear-mongering worked, and in 1937, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act. Here's Anne McGregor again. So that anybody who was actually using marijuana, even for medical reasons, had to pay a significant tax, and therefore it, it just ceased being used. As it then became recognized as a, as a drug of abuse, it then went completely out of fashion because nobody wanted to touch it because of all those, the, the social connotation. It turns out how we think about drugs depends on who we think is doing the drugs. Beyond simple racism, there's a theory Matt Crawford told me about that helps explain the stigma of cannabis. It holds that cannabis encourages behavior that goes against our fundamental values as Americans and our Puritan ideals. Those values are hard work, reliability, devotion to religion, and capitalism. Anyone who has ever used cannabis can tell you that it does not tend to promote these behaviors. Part of the problem with some of these psychoactive drugs is that they can induce a state of in intoxication where you lose control of your faculties, right? Um, you're no longer a rational actor, right? And if you compare something like marijuana or opium to, uh, you know, caffeine, right? I mean, that's a drug that many of us consume every day on a daily basis. Well, why is that? Because it wakes us up. It gives us energy, right? It, it makes us good actors in a productive, you know, sort of capitalist society, right? We're ready to go into the cubicle and, and do our work. Listening to Matt Crawford reminded me of what Joanna Kempner said about women failing to live up to their roles. And it got me thinking, when you take normal migraine meds, you can go about your day. Or at least that's the hope. But what would happen if I tried cannabis for my migraines? In Pennsylvania, medical cannabis is now legal, but migraines aren't a qualifying condition. I can't just walk into a dispensary and buy it. In moments of desperation, I've considered buying it on the street in Philadelphia where I live, but I know that the typical cannabis grown for street sales has been cultivated to get the user high, not necessarily to relieve their pain. So I wonder how much it would help me, and I worry that if I went down this path, I'd pay a price for getting rid of my migraines. I worry I might lose my productivity. This fear isn't unfounded. I've heard stories from patients saying as much. The irony is that this ability to care less, including about their migraines, is actually something doctors want for migraine patients. That's why antidepressants help them. The difference is that antidepressants usually make people more productive, not less. So what I need is for someone to hurry up and figure out which part of the cannabis plant and how much of it will bring me relief without making me stoned. But to get to this point, it needs to be easier for researchers to conduct clinical trials. Here's Anne McGregor again. 
certainly it would seem totally logical for people to have access to a medicinal-based, marketed, regulated compound that you knew had exactly the right dose, was quality assured, than it is for people to feel like they're disappearing around corners to to buy stuff off off the street um, and uh, you know that then be ostracized for doing so. Another problem with the long shadow of the drug stigma is that even in states where medical marijuana is legal, it's politicians, not doctors, who get to decide which conditions qualify. So there are many states when medical marijuana was introduced, it was really the lawmakers that were deciding what it could be used for and what it couldn't. And maybe that's a failure of the medical system, because once we allow politicians to to write uh, indications, um, you know, we're you know, who are we as physicians? And in order to appease the naysayers, uh, some of the states have very restrictive. Um, appropriate clinical indications for the use of cannabis. And it's really a mockery. Anne McGregor said something that I thought was a really important point. Even without further research, we know a lot about cannabis already, including about its safety. You know, one of the major factors is that medicinal grade um, cannabinoids have very few side effects. They're safe. But the stuff that you might buy um, from the unqualified people may not be safe. Chapter 5. The Resolution Back in March, a few days after I worried obsessively that I might lose my vision on the highway, my boyfriend Andy and I arrived in Northern California. In San Francisco, I decided to check out a fancy dispensary while he stayed at our rental. The customers looked like a richer version of me. One guy was buying a few joints for a Friday night at home. I talked to the owner. I told him about my migraines. He said he had the exact same condition. He recommended that I use a tincture of CBD with a little THC. I was still deeply skeptical, but I was also increasingly desperate. I opted to part with $86 and buy the pricey little tincture. Why not? A few days later, on a cold night in San Francisco, the second migraine in as many days disabled my vision while Andy and I were trying to watch a documentary. I was terrified by the prospect of more pain. So for the first time ever, I tentatively placed one drop of that CBD oil under my tongue. That drop made my body feel warm all over. I felt grounded slightly euphoric, and the pain in my face and head fell away in minutes. The migraine cycle, which can last for days, just ended right there. For the month that my little bottle of CBD oil lasted, I didn't get any migraines. I can't prove that CBD and CBD alone helped me, but I was ready to believe. I'm in the process of getting my medical marijuana card, not for migraines, but for chronic pain. As a migraineur, I've spent a lot of time searching in the dark for anything that can bring me relief. I don't know why the drugs that work for me work, but I use them anyway, because not using them means living with a constant threat of terrible pain. Not using them would mean living a smaller and smaller life. So I tinker, I read up on things, I experiment on myself, and I do the best I can. 900 years later, it's not all that different from what Hildegard von Bingen was doing in the 1100s, in the garden of her medieval monastery. For Distillations, I'm Ann Hoffman. So, Lisa, we've covered a lot of ground. I mean, really. A lot of (laughs) ground. So, I mean, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I just think it's so fascinating that medical cannabis is something that's very hot right now. And the sort of mainstream medical world is really starting to investigate it. And it's literally thousands of years old. We've known about it. We've (laughs) known that it can help, that it has therapeutic properties for thousands of years. But if you think about it, it narrows down to this one very specific moment in time, the 1930s, this very specific law enforcement perspective has just cut us off from this whole area of investigation. 
We, we didn't for decades and decades investigate the properties of cannabis. We pursued all these other things. All these other kinds of drugs got investigated. You know, all these other pathways got investigated, but not this one. We've spent all this time now rediscovering this idea of cannabis as treatment, but it also sort of feels like time wasted. Like, why don't we ever learn from the past and, and not throw away all of our knowledge? It, it feels like a bit of a waste to start from scratch every few hundred years or so. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I also find it, I found it interesting as we went through that so many of the stories of migraine researchers and people, people investigating these stories, they suffer from migraines. So this problem for them is so personal. And another thing that this podcast often does is we try to break down that myth of objectivity, that science is personal, can be personal, and even in many cases should be personal. That personal side of things should be acknowledged. That's what's driving their passion for this. They, that's what makes them want to find hope. And if anything, bringing more, uh, acknowledging that more can help break down the stigmas that we've talked about in this episode, hopefully. So I think we could talk about feminist nuns, migraines, and cannabis literally forever, right? Definitely. But sadly, we have to leave you. So tune in next time. And remember, Distillations is more than a podcast. We're also a multimedia magazine. You can find our videos, blog, and print stories at distillations.org. And you can also follow the Science History Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This episode was reported by Anne Hoffman. And it was produced by Mariel Carr and Rigo Hernandez. Jeanette Beebe was our fact checker, and Dan Drago did additional audio production. There's a lot of research that goes into each episode of Distillations, and we keep a list of everything and everyone we read, watched, listened to, and talked to on our website. So check it out. For Distillations, I'm Alexis Petrick. And I'm Lisa Berry Drago. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.